Yes, it is. Okay, so now we can really get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm the events coordinator here at Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, we are gathered here this evening to celebrate Andrew Segrist and his uh, beautiful and award-winning collection of short stories. We imagined it was rain. Uh, Tom Franklin's here too. Um, it's gonna be a wonderful evening. Uh, but before I pass it off to them, I'd like to tell you all about a few other events we have in the next week or so. Uh, so please bear with me. Um, might find something else you're interested in. Uh, okay, so Wednesday, November 10th, 6 p.m. Central Time on Zoom, we've got another installment of the Crossroads Book Group, this time featuring Dante Stewart in conversation with Matteo Ascaripor. Uh, he's the author of Black Buck uh, for Dante's Shouting in the Fire, an American Epistle. Uh, Kiese Laming calls it a magnificent offering. It's um, a stirring meditation on being Black and learning to love in a loveless and anti-Black world. Um, Shouting in the Fire chronicles Dante's journey first um, out of the white church after Donald Trump was elected in 2016, and then into a liberating pursuit of faith by looking to the wisdom of the saints that have come before, um, including James H. Cohn, James Baldwin, and Toni Morrison, and by heeding the paradoxical humility of Jesus himself. So it's an interesting intersection. Um, Dante is a wonderful thinker and writer. And uh, I know a lot of y'all have probably already read Black Buck, so I'm excited to um, hear Mateo weigh in as well. Um, again, that's Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. It's free to attend, but you do have to register. So you can visit our website, squarebooks.com slash event to learn more. Uh, you also get 15% off Chatting in the Fire if you use the coupon code CROSSROADS, that's one word, at checkout online. Um, then Thursday, November 11th at 6 p.m., this is um, an in-person event. The Bagger Mountain Radio is back at the Old Armory Pavilion. Uh, this week's author is a Mississippi poet uh, named Thomas Richardson. He'll be reading from his debut poetry collection called How to Read. And it is um, published by our friends in Columbus, Mississippi, Friendly City Books. I'm sure a few of y'all are already aware of them. They're wonderful. Uh, musical guests include Memphis Brass Band, the Mighty Souls Four, and Delta Bluesman, Keith Johnson. And of course, um, our Thacker's House Band, the Outlet Bushwhackers, and the show's wonderful host, Jim Bees, will also be in attendance. Uh, bring your own chair. We'll bring the books. You might also want to bring a blanket or hot toddy. It's going to be a little bit cold. Um, if you aren't local, you can visit our website for airtimes and links to listen remotely. One more. Uh, next Wednesday, November 17th at 6 p.m., we'll gather back on Zoom, this time to host the National Forest Foundation Communications Director, Greg M. Peters. Um, he's going to be in conversation with our Southern Studies pal and avid outdoorsman, Jimmy Thomas. They'll be discussing Greg's Our National Forests, uh, stories from the America's most important public lands. Again, it's free to attend, but you got to register. And again, you can do all of that by visiting squarebooks.com slash event. Uh, it's a really beautiful book. I think it'll be a great holiday gift. And um, last time I talked to Greg, he's working on a PowerPoint um, presentation, but he says it's, it's not your grandmother's PowerPoint if your grandmother made PowerPoints. Okay, but enough about them. I would like to tell you about the two gentlemen on your Zoom screen this evening. Uh, first, Andrew Segrist. He's a graduate of the Creative Workshop at the University of New Orleans. Um, his work has appeared in the Baltimore Review, Arts and Letters, the Greensboro Review, Pembroke Magazine, Fiction Southeast, Bat City Review, and elsewhere. He lives on the Cumberland River outside of Nashville, Tennessee, or perhaps just moved and is a little bit closer to Nashville now. Yeah. I guess we don't really need to know exactly where it's on the internet or we don't want it on the internet. <laughs> um, anyway, moving on, Tom Franklin is the New York Times bestselling author of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the Crime Writers Association's Gold Dagger Award. Um, his previous works include Poachers, 
Hill at the Breach, and Smonk. He teaches at the University of Mississippi's MFA program here in Oxford. And we're so glad that you do. Um, okay, so I've been talking for a while. Um, so I'm gonna stop and hand it off to these two guys. Um, those of y'all tuning in now, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A and I'll come back later in the evening to moderate those. Um, thank y'all both so, so much. And um, Andrew, congratulations on this beautiful hey. prize winning book. Okay, enough for me, y'all have fun. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, she does a great job with this and I'm really happy to be working with her on this and I appreciate her asking me. So again, thank you, Caitlin. You know, thanks to Richard and Lisa at Square Books, Cody, Slade, Bill, all the wonderful folks there. It's such a, a pleasure to be in a town with this kind of bookstore. Uh, Andrew, I see that um, we've got quite a, quite a nice crowd here. So congratulations. Thank you. I remember my very, I remember my first reading at Square Books for Poachers in 1999. I had about six people and I later realized you know, it was Cody Slade and other employees. So you, you, you're doing pretty well, congratulations. Well, it's a huge honor, and, and to speak with you is, uh, you, you know, you're one of my favorite writers, so it's really, it's a pleasure. Well, you're one of mine, too. It's a wonderful book. Um, I, you know, I, I have a couple of questions about the book first, then I'll go to some other kind of issues, if that's okay with you. Yeah. And then, um, so I'm... Andrew's going to read one of the... Um, uh, one of the stories from the book for us. So I guess, you know, reading the book and then looking back over it today, I'm struck by how much death there is in these stories. They are really, um, you know, just death is everywhere. And I, you know, I guess I, there's not really a question here except <laughs> to say, um, what's up with that? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, th th there's a beauty about these stories because they're, you know, they're often quiet stories mm -hmm. and they are, um, there's an old timey quality about the stories. Many of them, not all, but many are in past tense. And mm -hmm. there's just, you know, they seem like if I were, you know, to picture the guy who wrote these stories without knowing what you look like, without having met you at City Grocery, I would think you'd be a much older person. <laughs> and then, and then, so just, I guess, Perhaps somewhere in there, there's a question. Well, it's uh, it's interesting because you know um, I wrote a lot of these stories while I was in graduate school, so I was writing them kind of one at a time without thinking of it as a collection, and then going back and looking at them, um, like there's themes that come up that I wasn't aware that I was putting into all these stories. So um, a lot of times when I'm talking to someone about the book, they'll bring up things that I didn't realize that I was threading through all of these stories. Um, so I don't know, uh, to answer the question uh, that you've sort of asked, I, I don't know what, what's up with all the death. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I don't know. Well, that was a pretty good answer for a terrible question. <laughs> um, I know that you like the writer William Gay. He was once in, uh, on a panel I think it, it may be in maybe in Nashville at the uh, Southern Book Festival, mm -hmm. and, and and someone asked one of those long questions. He he later told me it was a question with semicolons, and <laughs> as the person was asking the question, William had a heart attack on on the stage. Oh wow! And you know, and and the person finally finished asking the question, and and his answer was, sometimes, you know, sometimes <laughs> there's just not really a great answer, but but you you got a pretty good one. Um, you mentioned this, that you know the stories you know are, are connected, or and and you know some of the reading I've done about this book mentions that their story, stories are connected. How are they connected? I think the main uh, connection with these stories would be the setting. Um, I grew up in Middle Tennessee, and then I've, I've I spent a lot of time in Southeast Tennessee in the Appalachian Mountains, and in my head, all these stories kind of take place in this amalgamation of those two places, sort of on the river in Middle Tennessee and then in the mountains in Southeast Tennessee. And it being a work of fiction, I feel like I can just set a story in both those places at the same time. And so that's, I, I think that's the through line to all these stories is, is the place. And um, 
yeah, just in my head, it's a, you know, they're 80 miles apart, but in, in a fictitious world, they can be in the same place. You write beautifully about landscape. Talk about, you know, landscape as character in, you know, in your work. Yeah, I think that's where I draw the most inspiration is just kind of being outside by myself and, and, and you know, um, I've never been uh, very good at plot. Uh, so for me, if, when I sit down to write, when I sit down with a blank sheet of paper, I'm gonna write a description of, you know, a leaf falling from a tree or something. I'm not, you know, I, I don't have um, a lot of big uh, intellectual ideas of, uh, in, in terms of like what I'm trying to convey with, with a story or, or a, a intricate plot, but, looking at, you know, the river passing by or looking at, you know, um, just the way the wind moves through the tall grass or something. That's sort of what I'm interested in as far as um, putting down on the page. Yeah, that's one thing I love about these stories and about your writing in general is that acute attention to detail. Um, it's something that I, you know, that I aspire to. And something that I most admire when a writer gets, you know, gets something right and makes me see it freshly or, you know, or see it anew. Um, how do you think you, you got that ability? You know, where did you learn? I'm sorry, you're, you're freezing up a little bit. Can you hear me? You froze up. Yeah, I, I, I do that often alone. I freeze up. But <laughs> my question was um, just that, are, well, I love your acute sense of detail. You really notice things beautifully, small things, you know, and, and often where you place them in, in the story, you know, near the end, perhaps, they achieve more significance than, you know, than just a leaf, as you say, you know, the, the leaf just, you know, becomes more than that. And that is, you know, um, to me, a true talent. And so my question was, where did you learn to, you know, learn that focus. Where did you learn how to notice things like that? I mean, I, I'm, to be completely honest, I think I stole it from writers like you, um, people that I read and, you know, reading uh, stories that I love, just picking up on those details. Um, I think I mentioned to you in an email earlier that I was gonna bring up Blue Horses, your short story. But I remember reading that and then the detail of him setting up, uh, you know, he has the, the model train and he has a blue horse out there. Details like that is what made me want to write. Like those little small things that you put in a story and then, um, you know, I often tell people like, the thing I love most about reading a short story is when you get to a detail like the blue horse and I just put the book down, I say, I need to sit with this for a second. Cause it's so, it's just so rich and it's so good. I just, I, like, I, you know, um, so to answer your question, it's, you know, reading other writers, reading short stories that I love. I agree, you know, I, I think maybe, you know, um, often writers are misfits and you know, we pay attention to how others are around us act so we can fit in. But we're, you know, we've talked about learning and, you know, about writing. You have a wonderful, or had a wonderful teacher, um, and I, I happened to be his teacher. We're talking about Neil Walsh, who writes, uh, publishes under M. O. Walsh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, and so what I told him, you know, you know, when he told me about your book, is that I said this is my first grand book, my students' students' book. That's incredible to me. Th this book will always have a you know a place in my heart, not just because I love it. I just because I love the writing and the story and, and I love how, you know, death driven it is. But, um, you know, I, I have that wonderful connection through, through Neil Walsh. Um, he was a great student here. As a student here, he was probably in my first or second class in the early 2000s here. And he pushed, but he also gave. In that class, um, I, I still remember things that he said, and that's, that's insane, this is 20 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. But he also established our Broken Reading series, which we still have, which still goes on. He started that. 
um, he once found out Barry Hannon's salary was kind of low. He wrote a, a letter in outrage, just, you know, a great citizen of our program. So he was a wonderful student. I'm wondering what it was like a, as a teacher. Well, I'll tell you, um, he actually uh, designed a class for me and a friend of mine and uh, at University of New Orleans based on a class that y'all had where he said y'all would meet at your house uh, you know, once a week, late at night and uh, talk about books. And he told me that story and I said, you know, can we design a class, you know, based on the Tom Franklin class that y'all had. And um, he introduced me to Lewis Norton, uh, Mark Richard, uh, your collection poachers. So I think him as a teacher, his enthusiasm for writing and for books and stories uh, was very contagious. And um, he's still to this day, you know, I, I graduated six years ago and, you know, he still is championing, championing my work and, you know, getting me in touch with writers and getting me, you know, obviously the blurb you gave for my book came directly from him. So, I mean, he is, uh, yeah, he's one of my biggest yeah, supporters and it's it's been great having him as a friend and a mentor. I remember that class so well. There were four of us. Um, and um, he wrote about that beautifully in the Oxford American, um, Neil did, about, because we read Lewis Norton um, and we, we threatened each other that we would get tattoos that said owls yeah, yeah, on our back. <laughs> and of course, nobody did it, you know. But uh, when Lewis Norton died, uh, he wrote this beautiful um, uh, remembrance of him. But um, I see the time is passing quickly, which is, is you know, surprises me. Um, but, I, you know, I, and I want to hear from our audience. But maybe before that, you would read um, from the book. Yeah, I'll read one of the shorter pieces. <clears throat> Uh, this is a story called Rain Painting. The summer we lived with dad, there was a neighbor whose voice we never heard. We'd seen him walking through the woods, fingers brushing the bark of trees or rustling the leaves of bushes, collecting berries in a paper sack. Sometimes he crouched in the creek bed and picked red pebbles from the cool water. He moved slow, always quiet, and often stopped as if listening to things we couldn't hear, like roots growing deep beneath him, the crack of a bird's egg in a high up nest. Once we drove by him on the gravel road near our house. He stepped into the ditch and waited for us to pass. Dad raised two fingers from the steering wheel and the man lifted his hand to his forehead, waving hello or shading his eyes from the sun, we couldn't tell. The rain painter, Dad said, watching the rear view mirror. When we asked what he meant, he told us he'd show us, but we'd have to wait. We stayed up late that night, making up stories. The rain painter standing beneath a heavy sky, wetting his brush with storm water, slashing at a canvas until something evil took shape. We listened with our ears pressed against the window for some promise of rain to break loose from the sky some spark to wake in the dark world. And if it had, we'd have been afraid to open our eyes, afraid the stories we told were true. The next morning, we walked past, he walked past our house carrying a stack of folded sheets. What's he doing, we said. Getting ready for the rain, Dad said. Dad had been checking the weather every night after calling Mom behind the closed door. We'd lie on the floor outside his room and listen as he begged her for a few more days. When the storm came, dad called in sick to work. With the first tinks of rain on the roof, he told us to hurry. We followed him through the woods that were thick with the smell of rain. The air had cooled. We watched, uh, we reached out our hands and felt the trees bark as we ran. Dad stopped and pointed to the canopy of the woods. Sheets, he said. We ran in circles beneath sheets that were hung between branches so high above us. Each sheet stained a different color. 
we outstretched our arms, our palms catching all different colors of rain. The strange rain dripped from our hair and down our faces, reds and blues and purples. We opened our mouths and tasted it. Some sheets were heavy with the weight of picked berries, other, others colored with the dust of crushed creek pebbles. When the rain lightened, our clothes were stained, our tongues and teeth carnival colored. We were laughing. Dad stood far away, watching silently. The next morning, we slipped back into the stained clothes we had begged him not to wash. And when mom picked us up, she shook her head. Couldn't even keep them clean, she said, before taking us away. I think you're on mute, maybe. How's that? Is it better? All right, I can hear you now. <laughs> Sorry, man. I just said the most eloquent thing, too. God, it's <laughs> eloquent. I, I at least said I'm so happy you read that story because I love it. I, I love its underlying sadness with the mother. Um, but really, it's a story about bad parenting, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. Um, it does remind me, you know, uh, and you may know. Did I freeze? Yeah, you froze a little bit. You're back. Yeah. I'm back. Okay. Uh, it, I just said, um, do you know William Gay's story, The Light Painter? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, so um, Caitlin, are there any questions from our audience? Um, yeah, we do have a question. Um, and if anyone else has any, now's the time. But this is um, this is a great one. Thank you, Christopher. So uh, Christopher says, "Thanks, Andrew, for spending time with us tonight." Um, I second that. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, when you write, and perhaps especially when you revise, how do you handle the story in your mind versus the story on the page? Um, this is a great question. Um, a writing mentor once told me that no matter how good the written product is, we'll never be able to truly capture what's in our head. And I'm curious if that speaks to you slash if it affects how you know when to finally decide a story is done. Whew, good one. No pressure, Andrew. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. I, it, for me, there's a weird um, progression in terms of writing is, uh, you know, when, the, when I'm looking at a blank page, I'm terrified. And then when I get an idea, I feel like this could be the greatest story I've ever written. And then when I have a couple drafts, I think it's the worst story I've probably ever written. And it just kind of cycles that way. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. I'm kind of forgetting the question, but. Um, <laughs> Sounds like love, falling in love, but go yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. it's just this constant cycle of like being very excited about an idea and then thinking you want to throw it away and then getting excited about it again. And <laughs> at some point you just have to print it and put it in a drawer somewhere. There you go. Um, okay, I have another one. Um, Drew says, um, how does poetry impact your work? Who are some of the poets you most like to read? So I think I know which Drew that is um, based on the question, but um, my favorite writer is C.D. Wright. Um, she's a, 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 well, she's passed away, but she's a poet. I think she's from Arkansas, but I mean, her poetry is, it's, yeah, she's my favorite writer and I can, you know, flip open a book of hers and read two or three lines, and then it just immediately puts me in that uh, mode that I want to. I want to start, you know, writing. And you know, yeah, she's. So I would say anyone who's who's looking for someone to read, uh, check CD right out. All right. Oh, you're all kinds of questions coming in. I like this audience. I love all of our audiences, but this is great. Um, Jenny writes, um, what sparks creativity for you or what helps you move your creative process along? 
Um, I'll give a kind of strange answer to this. There's a um, writing exercise that I do pretty often where I'll just um, actually use a random word generator uh, for online and just write like an entire page of nouns down and then go back and circle uh, 15 or 20 of them and then try and use those nouns in as short of a you know, like a page or two and try to get them all in. And mm -hmm. I found that doing that exercise, it creates some really um, interesting, not always great, but uh, <laughs> interesting pages that I can get down. So that's kind of my daily writing exercise that I do. I love that. A little like, I, mean, I guess it's not a wheel of po, but close. Um, okay, Gail says, um, did you write as a child or a very young person? Um, and, and did you journal ever? Did that affect your writing? So uh, embarrassingly, I have to admit that I, I came to writing very late. Um, I didn't actually even start reading till I was like 18 or 19. Um, Any time. Yeah. And so I started writing in college. So yeah, it's. It, I wish I had. A, I wish I had read and wrote as a child, but I unfortunately did not. Oh. I do now. Keep a journal and and try to write as much as I can. And hey, can I speak to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I don't I know. Think it matters at all. You know, if you would if you would have would have written or am I am I muted? No, you're good. You're on. Hold on. Okay. I was just gonna say, I don't think it mattered what you did as a kid. You know, I mean, you know, you, you know, uh, I think so much of what we write comes from our childhood and mm -hmm. from all the things that happened to you. So just to know what Flannery O'Connor said, if you can uh, survive childhood, you have enough material, to, you know, to, to last you the rest of your life. Enough and enough information, she said, to last you the rest of your life and. I always amend that to say, if you're a writer and you survive your childhood, you have enough material for the rest of your life. So, you know, um, oh, I think always having written doesn't matter. You know, what matters is you came at it at the right time. And college is a really good time, I think, to come at it because you're slowing down in the world and you're noticing what, you know, what really matters to you. So, you know, I, I, I you know, yeah. Can I ask you, Tom, when, when did you get uh, when did you start writing? Right from the womb, I was writing. <laughs> um, no, you know, but but what I was always doing uh, as a kid, and maybe you were too, and I can almost count this as writing, is telling stories in one way or another. Uh, I would um, play with little action figures, and I would construct narratives about them. Uh, I would... My cousins and I would make photo novels. We would take pictures of ourselves acting out little adventures mm -hmm. in costumes with plastic swords. And I'd paste them to the pages of a book and do captions of dialogue. So it was always in one way or another telling stories. Yeah. But, I, don't, you know, but I, I, I wrote Star Trek stories. I did what's now called fan fiction. I did it when you, it was just called plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, at some point, and honestly, I think it was like you in college, I noticed, well, I found Barry Hanna. And Barry mm -hmm. Hanna just took me by the lapel and said, stop. You know, not Stephen King, not like that. It's like this. Uh, and, you know, and I just started, I wanted nothing more than to write sentences like Barry Hanna's sentences. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, story mattered nothing to him. Yeah. And I, I love Barry Hanna's definition of plot. Plot, he says, he's, he said he was channeling Charles Bukowski. Plot is the creature slithering through his day. <laughs> and so, you know, I love that. So, yeah, um, so, uh, you know, kind of always telling stories, but, but like you finding the literary light in, in college. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I for me, it was, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, when I read him, I was like, all right, I need to, I need to try this out. I need to see if I can uh, do something even similar to what he's doing. Oh, wow. Thank you both. Um, all right, I've got, I've got another question. This is from Jacob. 
uh, he says, thanks, Andrew and Tom. Um, and then, Andrew, which story in this collection was the most difficult for you to complete? And could you tell us a little about it and maybe why you struggled with it or, or how you struggled with it? Hmm. Um, let me look, uh, the most difficult, let's see. Um, I'd say uh, the story Satellite probably was the most difficult. Um, and I don't know, I think I was kind of writing it, it was after I'd finished graduate school and so I was sort of writing it in a, what felt like a void, like I didn't have anyone to show it to. Mm -hmm. I would finish a draft and I'd reread it and I didn't really have anyone to bounce the story off of to see if it was working or not. Um, and at the time I actually had, uh, I had a uh, injury at work. Uh, I'm a carpenter, and I, I was I had a I had cut myself pretty badly, and I was off work for about six months, um, oh, no. kind of rehabilitating this injury, and that was the story I wrote during that time. So, uh, well, that makes sense. It's um, are you are you okay? You yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a coming, but. Um, that story actually came from that because I was, you know, I was, you know, medicated at the time because of the surgery and the, the, the line that I, you know, kind of wrote the story about was based on, on that experience. So I guess it was the hardest story and it, it kind of, um, yeah. Yeah, I really liked that question because I feel like, you know, we could probably ask you that question every day of the week and you might have maybe a different answer each time for you oh, know. every single time yeah yeah um okay uh this is a nice one and it kind of calls back to what um y'all were talking about just kind of like your um wonderful ability to kind of like just notice and then kind of amplify those those smaller um details but uh john John writes, um, light plays a role in your stories and could you comment or elaborate on that? So again, you got lots of lots of places to go with this question. The role of light in your writing. Light, yeah. Um, I don't know, it's, it's again, it, it's one of those things where, you know, I feel like people's questions are a lot smarter than I am as a writer. <laughs> so people, come to your stories and point things out to you that you're like, I had no clue that that was uh, a theme that I was trying to explore. But yeah, I mean, I think it is, um, I think it's just one of those things that I do notice and, you know, kind of, you know, you know take note of and, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, the deeper theme of it is, but uh, yeah, it is something that I, I definitely take note of yeah we don't yeah we don't need like thorough things sometimes it just it just is and, and that's almost even more wonderful you know just like like leaves or grass um so uh, while if anyone has another question this, this would be a great time to to ask it but i realized um i a little bit buried the lead um i failed to explain uh, what prize your story won. So if, if it's all right, I'd like to tell folks right. uh, brag on you a little bit, if that's okay, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, so we imagined it was Rain is the recipient of the 2020 C. Michael Curtis Short Story Book Prize. Um, and this is awarded by Hub City Press, which is a uh, fantastic indie press that we just um, loved to bits. And I'm so glad that they um, published your your book and um, that you won this prize. So the prize is named in honor of C. Michael Curtis, who has served as an editor of The Atlantic since 1963 and as a fiction editor since 1982. Curtis has discovered or edited some of the finest short story writers of the modern era, including Tobias Wolfe, Joyce Carol Oates, John Updike and Anne Beattie. Um, he's edited several acclaimed anthologies, including contemporary New England short stories, God, stories, and faith stories. Um, and he moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina 
in 2006 and has taught as a professor at both Wofford and um, Converse Colleges, in addition to serving on the editorial board of Hub City Press. And um, yeah, stiff competition. I, I meant to tell you this before we kind of went live that I was reading about the prize and um, just so well deserved and um, so thrilled for you and for Hub City. Match made in heaven. <laughs> and while I was uh, bragging on you, uh, we have another question. Let's, is, is, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Margo writes, um, how does where you live and or the time you spend in nature influence your work? Um, it's the biggest influence. Um, well, you mentioned earlier that I just moved. I told you that, but um, for the past almost decade, I lived out kind of in the middle of nowhere um, on the river outside of Nashville. And yeah, just being out there every day and being in the midst of, you know, just the middle of the woods is, um, yeah, it's what I, it's what I enjoy observing. It's what I enjoy writing about. Um, you know, I tell people I could never write a story set in an office building or something like that, <laughs> or like a, you know, a story about a, a banker going to work. But um, yeah, just that's, it's sort of what is inspirational to me is, you know, being outside, being near the water, being, you know, in the woods. I love that. And I feel like um, this is um, such a, an autumnal read, if that makes any sense. I don't know, just like even the, um, here folks, this is all just like fall on top of me. Not this time. Um, it's such a like, I don't know, cool and beautiful cover. And I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but um, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, I don't know. And I feel like you can judge it by its cover. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was Kirkus Reviews who said something like, um, wait for a rainy day and just and read this in one sitting. And I just, um, those books are really rare. And I'm glad that um, you wrote one that um, encourages that kind of like cocooning and just nuzzling up with it and kind of um, walking around in your wonderful brain for an afternoon. <laughs> uh, but I'm just such a wonderful job with the books. I'm sorry, Caitlin, to interrupt. No, no, go on. Yeah, this is just like a love fest now. And, um, it's totally fine. Your turn. <laughs> no, um, Megan came there to do a really terrific job. And I, I worked, you know, with them, with um, George Singleton. I think I did, I think someone else did his Square Books event. And I did one with Hub City. I did do an event with George, but it wasn't with Square Books. Um, and, you know, and they were just terrific to work with. Um, they, and they, you know, you're in good company um, with George Singleton. And, and other writers at that press. The Hub City is terrific. Oh, they've been amazing. Uh, I could not have picked a better, well, I didn't pick them, they, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I could not have asked for a better publisher. Oh, yeah. Have you met or did you talk to ZZ Packer at all? I haven't, not yet, no. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, post pandemic, I can, I can meet her in person at some point. No, ZZ Packer was the the judge for the the prize um, that that Andrew won. In case y'all didn't know, um, but yeah, I just um, I don't know, I'm just rambling now because this has been so lovely. Uh, but oh, okay, looks like we do have one more question, and then perhaps we should wrap it up and um, say good night. Uh, okay, so Celeste writes. Um, I noticed an understated humor in your stories that was surprising somehow. Funny. Uh, do you consciously use humor? It's another tough one. Yeah, it is tough. Um, no, I, I will say though that I do put a lot of like inside jokes for just my friends. Like I'll name characters or name things that only my friends will know. And um, I guess that is my little uh jab at humor just just so the people that i you know that get the joke know it but i, I don't try to write you know i don't try to put jokes in there i will add this 
there, there's humor, but it's very dark humor, which, <laughs> is, which you know we shouldn't be surprised by. Like you know, the executing the elephant story. Sorry, but it's kind of funny. Whenever you execute an elephant, it's funny. It shouldn't be. But that that that's a that's a story based on true events. So yeah. Oh God. <laughs> if you want to if you want to Google the picture, you can. But I wouldn't. Uh, I, wouldn't I don't. I don't. Know. I'm not going to send you all that link, audience. I read <laughs> Um, man, I don't want to end on that note. <laughs> um, but anyway, this has just been um, a wonderful evening. And thank you for for reading to, I think, if those of y'all who haven't read the book yet, I think it gives you um, a really nice kind of taste for, I hate that, uh, but, you know, kind of sense for what kind of um, book you'll, you'll have when you buy it. Um, and I, I've linked it like quite a few times, but if you um, haven't bought it yet, uh, I would really love to sell it to you. We have book plates in the mail right now. I'm happy to hold your book until those arrive. And um, just a little, a little guilt trip, um, Square Books or any independent bookstore um, can't hold author events, virtual, in-person, hybrid, you know, whatever we come up with next, puppet shows, who knows. Um, without your support. So if you don't have the book yet, um, I would really encourage you to buy it from us um, or you know your local indie, but maybe us. And um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Andrew, Tom, would y'all like to, to say the last thing so it's not more of, of me speaking? <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you so much to Tom and to you, Caitlin. Like it, this oh, yeah. is really, really special for me. That's it for me too. Thank you both. I've really had a good time and it's a beautiful book, everybody. I promise you. Mm -hmm. Also, paperback original, French flaps. It's just first class all the Classic. way. Love Classic. it. <laughs> I do it love, um, yeah, it does. Yeah, it smells good. Um, yeah, um, Andrew, I so look forward to hosting you um, for the next book. Maybe we'll get to do it in person. We can all go to City Grocery this time. Uh, if not then, then... Yeah you know, perhaps sticks at the Ryman, who knows. Um, but okay, um, this has really been wonderful. Thank you both thank you so much. much. And, and thank you to our wonderful audience um, for, for all your wonderful questions. It's so, so great. Um, and yeah, anyway, wishing everybody good health and happy reading. Take care. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank y'all. Oh, and thank you, uh, Kate, your wonderful publicist. It's been such a pleasure to work with her, too. Okay. Um, so fond of you all. Thank you for everything you do. All right. I'm going to push the big red button and say goodnight. Okay. Bye.